And good evening, folks. That'll do. Thank you very much. Um, I'm really pleased to be invited to talk to you about this topic, but I'll also tell you that it's hard work to think about suffering and pain. This is the Easter season when we're supposed to be happy and jubilant in church because Jesus is alive. Hallelujah. Makes you smile. That's good. A couple of you. And that means that the good news of the gospel is that death has been defeated and suffering has come to an end, sort of, and that there's something for us to offer the world. And that's all good, right? On the screen, hopefully in a second, will appear some stats. If you jump, brilliant. Oh, excellent, thank you very much. Now then, I'm going to turn around because I can't see the screen anymore. And that's what ones. Um, actually, though, we know the world we live in hasn't yet been fully transformed by the good news of the gospel. Uh, a couple of years ago in 2021, an organization called Pew Research, who are a kind of statistical, uh, an, 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 a, a group of statistical analysts, they um, asked all the adults that they could uh, in a survey uh, how often you think about pain and suffering. And 61% of adults said they think about the suffering of others either regularly or very regularly, by which they meant regularly on a fortnightly to monthly basis or very regularly on a daily basis. And of course you would, wouldn't you? Because every time you turn on the news, whether it be on the TV or the radio or in a newspaper or you're having a conversation with friends, there is something, thank you whoever turned that on, there is something about the brokenness and messiness of the world that you cannot escape. Whether it be poverty, whether it be war in Ukraine, whether it be the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer, there are stories of suffering and pain all around us. And if you happen to be one of the very few fortunate people alive on the planet who haven't yet experienced significant suffering, or you don't know somebody who is suffering through ill health, or fear, or anxiety, or they've lost their job, or their marriage has fallen apart, or they've got no sense of what the future holds, God bless you, but you are in a very, very, very small minority. Suffering and pain is all around us. And 61% of adults say they think about it on either a weekly, on either a daily or at least a monthly basis. When Christians were asked about the same question, 17% of Christian adults said suffering is a, a good reason, is not a good reason to believe, oh sorry, is a good reason to not believe in God. So that means the other 83% said it's not a good reason. But 17%, a small minority said, yeah, the presence of suffering and pain in the world is a good reason to turn your back on God and turn your back on religion. The other 80-something percent said, no, it's faith in God that helps me make sense of suffering and to deal with it. But here's the really interesting thing. In that Pew Research, 46% of Christian adults said the presence of suffering and pain in the world had made them rethink something they had been taught about God. Something that their church leader or their Bible study group or their parents or whoever, but they had to rethink what they had always believed about God because of the presence of suffering and pain in the world. If you read the survey in full, if uh, you've got the time or you're struggling with insomnia, um, you'll find out that some of those people even began to wonder whether God really loves everybody or only some people. A different survey, um, can I go to the next slide, thanks. A different survey published by another group called the Barna Group, who are also a group of statistical analysts who con conduct surveys, asked this question. Assuming God exists, if you could ask God one question and you definitely get an answer, what would it be? Overwhelmingly in that survey, just over 20%, but overwhelmingly of all the possible answers given by these Christians, by, by these people, not just Christians, by these people, the overwhelmingly leading answer was why is there suffering in the world? Why is there suffering in the world? This topic you're tackling tonight, that we're tackling together tonight, is really crucial for discipleship, but it's crucial for mission as well. We are people of hope in a world where suffering and pain is rife. 
And this matters because it's about the kind of God we worship, the kind of God we believe in, the kind of God we've just been singing about and singing to, the kind of God to whom we offer our prayers and our praises. How can we make sense of faith in this God, who we say is loving and kind and generous and good, and the presence of evil and suffering and pain in the world? Some people say you can't, including this dude. Why am I not saying this? coolest beard. I like the fact that his head, his, the hair on his head and the hair on his chin sort of look the same, as if you could turn him upside down. Uh, this is an ancient philosopher. His name is Epicurus. Uh, he lived and worked about two and a half thousand years ago, and he's known as the father of atheism. He ran a sort of school for philosophers in Athens, in Greece, called the Garden. It sounds a bit pretentious, doesn't it? But Epicurus, um, um, he had a theory about belief in God. And he had a theory about the presence of suffering. And that theory has come to be known as Epicurus's trilemma. Trilemma instead of dilemma. So a dilemma, you've got two options to choose between. A trilemma is three options to choose between. And the reason Epicurus matters is because 200 years or so ago, at the birth of the Enlightenment, when people started to think about science and to rationalize the world and try and push God out of the world and religion out of the world as if it was superstition, they looked to Epicurus as the father of modern um, belief, of modern philosophy. Someone who would say to us, only trust what you can see and only trust what you can measure. And in a world full of brokenness and pain, of suffering and of evil, what you can see doesn't look good for God. Epicurus started his trilemma, on my next slide, with three ideas about God. That God is all-knowing, that God is all good, and that God is all powerful. They sound about right, don't they? Anyone want to disagree with those? Please don't do it now. It makes things last longer. And Abbott watches his, watches his clock when I speak. Um, maybe later. They sound right. God is all knowing. We need God to be all knowing because it's one of the ways that we can trust God. See, if God was forgetful, if God didn't remember things, how do you know he's not forgotten you? Even though Epicurus lived before Jesus, um, he was speaking quite happily to Jews and others of faith in God. And he would say, you lot, you need God to know everything because you need God to know you so that you are not forgotten. And we Christians think the same. God knows everything. And so he hasn't forgotten me and he hasn't forgotten you. We also need God to be all good. You see, if God is sometimes a bit of a git, but he's hiding it from the rest of us, that's no good because you don't know which side you're on. Are you on God's good side or are you on God's bad side? But Christians have always believed that God is good. And because God is good, he's trustworthy. I can trust God because he's not sometimes having a bad day when he wakes up in a grump because he didn't sleep well and he thinks, right, what can I do to get those idiots that call themselves my disciples? No. God is good. And it's really crucial, it's really central to our Christian faith that we're able to affirm that God is good and that makes God trustworthy and reliable. And finally, that God is all-powerful. See, we need God to be all-powerful because without God's power, you and me are stuffed. It's a technical theological term. It's the sort of thing we used to teach Alex. It's we're stuffed without God's help. We need God to be bigger and stronger and more powerful than all the stuff that brings us down. Bigger and stronger and more powerful than our own stupidity. And there's a lot of that around. We need God to be bigger and stronger and more powerful than the worst things that we can do to each other. So Christians have long affirmed all three of these ideas because it means God is trustworthy, it means God will save us, and it means God has not forgotten us. He's all-knowing, all-good, and all-powerful. But Epicurus said the problem with these three ideas is they get absolutely stuffed when you introduce suffering. 
See, once you introduce suffering, you've got a problem. If you look at the world around you and the mess that it's in, you might wonder some things. For example, you might wonder, if God is really all-knowing, then he must know about all the suffering, right? So if he knows about all the suffering, why hasn't he done anything about it? Is it because he's not really good? He doesn't really care. He knows about it, and he's got the power to do something. He's all-powerful, but he just doesn't care enough to be bothered. Or, says Epicurus, maybe God is good and he does care. But maybe he doesn't know. He's got the power and he cares, but there's just some stuff God doesn't know. He doesn't know about your difficult circumstances. He doesn't know about that horrible cancer diagnosis. He doesn't know that someone's lost their job. Maybe God missed the whole Ukraine thing. He doesn't know. And that's why there's suffering in the world. Because nobody told him, and he's not been able, therefore, to do anything about it. Or, says Epicurus, maybe God's just not very powerful. He cares, and he knows, but he hasn't got the strength to do anything about it. He hasn't got the strength. Suffering, pain, evil is all bigger than God. Well, Epicurus was called the father of atheism because he said in the end, the presence of suffering tells us either God doesn't care, God doesn't know, or God can't be bothered. He doesn't have the power. But either way, that God is not worthy of worship. Suffering, says Epicurus, tells us there is no God. Because if there were a God, surely he'd be kind and generous enough. Surely he'd be powerful enough. Surely he would know enough to step in, to turn things around, and to take it all away. Maybe it's the conversation you've had with somebody in the pub before. Maybe you've wondered it for yourself. How can I take God seriously? How can I sing about God's love when when I go home I'm going to live with someone who's really struggling? How can I sing about God's provision when I don't know if I can pay the bills at the end of the month? How can I talk about God's kindness when I see refugees and asylum seekers, when I see those who are desperately in need on the streets in Liverpool and think, where is this God? It's a powerful set of questions, right? My problem with it as a sort of teacher of theology and philosophy is this. I don't recognize Epicurus's God. Some scholars have described it a bit like this, if I could have my next slide. That Epicurus has made up this omni-God. You see, those three ideas that God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-good have kind of posh philosophical terms attached to them that God is omnipotent omnipotent meaning all powerful omnipotent once said that in church and a seven year old boy came up to me afterwards called Thomas maybe he was eight and he says my mommy calls hers a bra I said Thomas I've no idea what you're talking about he said you were talking about nipple tents in the service (laughs) I know So I've always tried to say that word very, very clearly since then. (laughs) Omnipotent, not omnipotent. (laughs) I'll never forget that voice. That God is all-powerful. Or omniscient, that God knows everything. Or omnibenevolent, that God is all good. And the thing is, when we Christians talk about God, we don't do it by using a set of philosophical ideas. God is not an idea. God is a person to be known and loved and who longs to know us and share his love with us 
in return. We're invited not into uh, knowledge when we're invited to know God. We're invited into relationship. And that's really important because what it means is when we Christians want to talk about who God is and what God is like, when we Christians try to make sense of suffering, we don't start with philosophy and philosophical ideas about God. We start in the place where God has shown himself. We start with Scripture because that's a place where God tells us the story of who he is and what he's like. So there's four things that I think might be able to help us today think a little bit about suffering and who God is and what God is like and how we Christians are supposed to make sense of that. And if you've got a Bible, it might be helpful to have it nearby because we'll look at a few different texts from Scripture to help us do that thinking. But the four themes, if I can have my next slide, are these. The first is about sin. That sin is a spiritual reality that affects everything. So we've got suffering, we've got evil, and we've got sin. It's going to be a jolly old evening. Sin is a spiritual reality that affects everything. Come back to that in a minute. Secondly, that God does see, God hears, and God comes to rescue. This is part of the story of who God is as we see it and encounter it in Scripture. Thirdly, that Jesus is God's rescuer. But he doesn't do it in the way that you might imagine. He doesn't ride in on his white horse, wielding his sword, driving out the evil and suffering of the world. Jesus is God's rescuer who suffers with us. It's a completely potty idea. It's one of the things that makes Christianity stand out amongst all the faiths of the world. That God rolls up his sleeves and gets involved in the mess, the brokenness, the destruction of human life and that finally we are still waiting for healing and restoration of all things we are hopeful people we are longing for the second coming of Jesus we are looking forward to him completing his work by bringing the kingdom by transforming this world by turning it on its head so let's start with sin anyone good at sin you bunch of liars. There's a sin right there. You're well practiced. Of course we are. We've learned it. It's a terrible thing. It's one of the things that dehumanizes us and undermines us. But often we have the wrong picture of sin. If I can have my next slide. The next few slides have all got a few pictures on them just um, to help us think. This is uh, an engraving uh, um, uh, for the 16th century of the Garden of Eden. And you can see there this sort of weird serpent next to the tree telling Eve to pull down an apple. Um, incidentally, uh, it's not an apple that uh, Adam and Eve eat in the garden. It's a mango. Do you know that? It's true. You can tell your friends. Because afterwards, God says, man, go. Anna, take your head out of your hands. I'm appalled. It's a brilliant line, that. You can have that for the future. Um, in the garden of Eden, when he uses this, you need to remember, this was my joke originally. Because he'll make it sound cooler than me. It's not fair. Um, in the garden of Eden, the vision of sin and brokenness that we get is not some people do it, is not simply some people doing some naughty things. If you go back and look at Genesis chapter 3, where the fall happens, where sin sort of comes into the world, actually, it's not just Adam and Eve who are screwed up and screwed over. It's the whole of creation. The land, the ground is cursed. There's a broken relationship, not just between Adam and Eve and God, but between human beings, between Adam and Eve. As soon as God turns up and says, uh, where are you? What are you doing? Why are you hiding from me? Adam blames his missus. It was her fault. She gave me the apple. I was distracted by the whole nakedness thing, and I wasn't paying attention to the rules, and I ate the apple or mango. And uh, it, so it's her fault. It's not my fault. The relationship between God and and, and the human beings is messed up. The relationship between Adam and Eve is messed up. The relationship between the human beings and creation is messed up. Everything gets messed up. Sin is not just about people doing things wrong, as if all you had to do was learn to do things right in order to be good with God. Sin is about the messed up brokenness of the world God has made. Everything is out of kilter. That's a really important 
point because it sets the context in which we think about suffering. There are all sorts of different kinds of suffering in the world. Some of them are what we call anthropogenic forms of suffering. Anthropogenic means man-made or human-made. Can't just blame the men. Human-made. We hurt each other. We are selfish and greedy. We look after number one. That's the kind of suffering we inflict on other people to protect ourselves. And we do it all the time. We've got a long history. We're well practiced as human beings of doing it, of hurting each other. Sometimes we do it without meaning to. Sometimes we do it because we're careless and thoughtless. Sometimes we do it because we think we're more important than other people. But we see that sort of thing all the time. And perhaps you know this about yourself. Perhaps you have a bit of a tendency to be a bit of a selfish git. We all do. It's not the only kind of suffering that exists in the world, though. Some kinds of suffering, what we call natural disasters, things that happen that don't make sense to us. Somebody gets ill, and it's senseless. Uh, there's a hurricane, and it's senseless. There's a tsunami, and it's senseless. None of it makes any sense to us. But actually, in the bigger picture of Scripture, all of it is part of the bigger effect of a world that's disordered, that's out of kilter, that's messed up and broken. Sin is not simply you doing the wrong thing, swearing at the dog, watching porn, stealing money, punching somebody. It's not just about us making moral mistakes. It's about the whole context of the world in which we live. It's messed up and it's broken and it's out of kilter. That's why part of the good news of the gospel, when Jesus comes, if you go away and read, say, Colossians chapter 1, when Paul celebrates the coming of Jesus, he doesn't say he's come to save some sinful scumbags like you and me. He says the whole of creation is being remade. The whole of creation is being transformed by Jesus. When the kingdom of God comes, it doesn't just come to carry us off into heaven. The kingdom of God comes to renew the whole earth. Go away and read the end of the book of Revelation. We're not all taken off to heaven to sit on harps, sit on harps, sit on clouds playing harps when we die. Could sit on harps, it might be interesting. In the book of Revelation, God's kingdom comes down to a renewed, transformed world. The whole of creation is caught up in the picture of what Jesus is doing because sin is pervasive, it's everywhere. It's not just the mistakes we made. It's about the brokenness, the disorderliness of everything that there is. And it's about God's work, God's effort to fix it. And that's the thing about God. What we see in scripture over and over again is he doesn't sit back and say, well, I did tell you so, so you're gonna have to fix that yourselves. I said, if you don't do as you're told, it's all going to go wrong. I said, if you don't learn to do it my way, you're going to screw this up for yourselves and for each other and for all those who come after you and for the whole of creation. If you're a told-you-so sort of person, you'll understand what I'm trying to say. Last night, we watched a rerun of Saturday Night Takeaway because we missed it last weekend. And my 13-year-old daughter was told very clearly after break, after uh, segment number two, so after the break, that she had to go as soon as the break started and brush her teeth and put her pajamas on if she wanted to watch the rest. Now, she's 13 and I'm her father, so you can imagine what happened. She faffed and farted about and didn't do what she was told to do. And so by the time she eventually got her foot on the stairs to go up and brush her teeth, the break was over. Now, what should I have done? Well, it turns out, I discovered this morning from my wife, the dog, my daughter, and my son, I was supposed to pause the replay at that point so she could come back and watch it. But I thought this would be a really great learning opportunity. So instead, I let it play. She heard and thundered down the stairs with a toothbrush hanging out of her mouth, half her pajamas on, and trying to pull her trousers on at the same time. Why didn't you stop it? Well, darling, I enjoyed it a bit too much. You should know that there are consequences to the decisions that we make. And if you ignore the wise advice of your father to get your backside upstairs, brush your teeth, get your pajamas on inside of three and a half minutes, then I can't help it that you miss the next three and a half minutes of Anton Deck. 
that's your fault. Maybe next time you'll remember this moment and you will shift your gears. Anyone want to guess how well that went down? <laughs> Not at all. Even my wife looked at me over the top of her crochet. <laughs> Fool. My son just rewound it. Dad, you're having a moment. God isn't like that, and he's not like me. God was not sitting back, looking at Adam and Eve, looking at the mess of the world and saying, well, if you'd just done as I told you, you wouldn't be in this mess. In fact, if I can have my next slide, there's a really beautiful moment in Exodus chapter 3. You might get the burning bush image there. I'm going to read this to you because I love this story and I love the way this unfolds. If you know the story uh, of the, the beginning of Exodus, Moses is out in the desert looking after his father-in-law's sheep because he's a total scumbag and he's murdered somebody. And because he's a wimp, he's run away rather than face justice. And God hasn't let him run away and hide in the desert. God has turned up in the form of a burning bush to invite him into a conversation. Now, I don't know about you. If, someone start, if a bush started talking to me, I might start to wonder whether I'd had too much cheese or too much of that whiskey that I used to drink with Alex. But Moses doesn't do that. He approaches, and the bush says, take off your shoes, so he does it. But the bush goes, it's not the bush, it's God in the bush, goes on and says this, verse 7. The Lord said to him, I have seen the misery of my people who are suffering in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their suffering. And I have come to save them. I have come to deliver them. I love that text because it's actually a bit of a paradigm for the way God is right through Scripture. There are stories over and over again where God says, I have seen the mess, I've seen the suffering, I've heard the pain, and I have come to save. I have come to deliver. I have come to rescue. You flick back into the book of Genesis. There's a story of um, Abraham's wife, well, Abraham's uh, slave, Hagar. And she runs away into the desert to get away from Abraham because he's being a total sod. And out there on her own with her child, with no help and support, God comes to her and says, I've seen your misery. I've heard your cry. And I have come to save you. If you fast forward to King Hezekiah, who's a completely rubbish king, and he's pathetic in the face of opposition, those who are trying to invade. They call him a bird in a bird cage. He's pretty to look at. He's all decked in his finery. He tweets a bit, but he does absolutely nothing. He's trapped. And God says, I have come. I've seen the mess you're in, and I have come to set you free. I have come to deliver you. This is who God is. He does not stand back and say, well, the mess that you're in, the suffering and pain that you face, the brokenness and disorderliness of the world, this is an excellent learning opportunity for you. No. God rolls up his sleeves and he steps down into the mess. He comes to be where we are. do think this is the most significant thing about the Christian faith. God sees, God hears, God knows, and God comes to rescue. And the rescuer is not standing on the edge of the boat, throwing in the life belt. The rescuer is not standing at the top of the cliff, lowering down a rope so that you can grab onto it and they'll pull you out to safety. The rescuer is not distant far away, watching the mess and saying, well, here's a bit of help. The rescuer is God himself. This is my next slide. Because the rescuer is Jesus. Jesus rolls up his sleeves, steps into the mess, and takes on himself all that is broken and twisted and distorted about the world that we live in. In other words, this God does not observe our suffering and offers a way out. This God suffers with those who suffer. It's such a powerful move. I don't love this image on the screen, but I use it quite a lot. It's called the Eisenheim altarpiece. 
Um, it was painted, it was completed about the year 1515, just before Martin Luther uh, kicked off the Reformation in 1517. And um, it's, I think it's really powerful because you see just how emaciated and messed up Jesus' body has become. If you get a close-up on the hands and this image isn't good enough, the artist has captured the distortion, the contortion in the hands as the nails have pierced the flesh. And uh, I was talking to a friend of mine a number of years ago who was a doctor. He said, that's exactly what would happen. Those beautiful, serene images of Jesus on the cross where he looks quite calm and peaceful as he's dead um, aren't actually the full story. You put nails through your hands and not only does it hurt, which I imagine it does, but your body will contort, your hands will twist with the pain and will become stuck. And uh, um, the Matthias Grunwald, who painted this, has captured something of that brokenness and messiness. And you see, that's what's going on here. If you know the story of Holy Week, that week leading up to the death of Jesus, this isn't just a radical being put to death by some Romans. This is a dude whose mates have abandoned him. We will never leave you, Jesus. That was short-lived, Peter. I don't know him. I've never met him. Who are you talking about, Jesus? No, I'm not from around there. The court that tried him was bent. The witnesses have been paid backhanders to lie. The religious leaders who should have known better because they were familiar with the prophetic word of God in the Old Testament told lies about him. They, they encouraged the crowds to shout crucify and to release a scumbag like Barabbas. Everything that is messed up, screwed up and broken about human relationships, about human hearts, he bore it all. Unjustly, unfairly, all because he chose to suffer with those who suffer. I'm not saying this makes our suffering and the suffering of the world go away. But if I were going to believe in any God at all, and I do, don't worry, it's this one. Because only this one gets stuck in to the mess. In 1945, there was a German soldier called Jürgen. He'd been a member of uh, the, the Hitler Youth, and he had signed up as soon as he was able, aged 18. At age 19, turns out he wasn't a very good soldier. He got captured and put in a prisoner of war camp in Belgium. Jürgen was an atheist, an angry atheist. But he was also bored in the prisoner of war camp. So when an American chaplain gave him a New Testament, initially, he says, he threw it in the sort of potty in the corner where he's supposed to take a pee. And he threw it in there. That's what I think of this Bible. That's what I think of your God. But after a week or so, he was so bored, he thought he'd give it a read. And he tells the story that he read first Mark's Gospel, and then Matthew and John, and then the letters of Paul and Peter. And then he read the whole thing. He finished it in a prisoner of war camp in Nottingham, in England. And by the time he'd finished reading the whole New Testament, he'd become a Christian. He's still alive today. He's in his 90s. His name is Jürgen Moltmann. He's one of the most sort of famous theologians that's still alive. And he wrote a big fat book about the suffering of God called The Crucified Christ or The Crucified God. And it was all about what he called the fellowship of suffering. That only a God who comes to be in the mess with us is worthy of our worship. Now, Maltman makes a really important point in that book. He says, if all God did were to come down and to suffer with those who suffer, all you'd have is a lot of suffering. God's suffering and our suffering. But here's the thing. After every Good Friday, there is an Easter Sunday. Suffering and pain and death does not have the final word. It can be really hard to believe that because there's so much of it round about us. It can be hard to believe that if you are wading through your own personal suffering and pain. But the Christian promise is, because of Jesus, suffering and pain and death does not have the final word. 
We are a people of hope. We look forward. We don't act as if suffering doesn't happen, but we know it's time limited. And we know, no matter how messed up it is, we are a resurrection people. We are people of hope because Jesus will come again. And that means we're, talk, we're stuck, caught, waiting between two points. The resurrection of Jesus, his presence with us now, longing, anticipating, waiting for his coming again. If I can have my last slide up, thank you. When he comes again, all things will be renewed. When he comes again, all things will be healed turned upside down and the right way up. All things will be transformed. When he comes again, suffering and pain and death will cease when he comes again. That's why we pray it in the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done. We're longing for that future that God has for us to come into the present. We're saying, God, make what will be happen now asking him bring forward bring into the present the coming kingdom transform and renew the face of the earth it's not that jesus didn't work hard enough the first time and he failed a bit it's that we long for the completion of the work he started st paul in ephesians talks about the holy spirit as the kind of down payment of god's future hope for us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, he talks about living with our present sufferings, knowing that the future hope is coming. Knowing that these sufferings do not have the final word. This image is an icon. It's a, um, from the Greek Orthodox Church. It's about a thousand years old. And I like it because um, even though it's a bit hard to see, what you've got is Jesus coming again and the big circle around him is all of his angels and archangels and all the dead who've gone before us in Christ coming again, as it says in 1 Thessalonians. And underneath, you've got creation being renewed, trees and plants, the whole of creation being transformed as well as the people in it. It's a big vision that when Jesus comes again, all the mess that happened in Genesis, the disorderliness, the brokenness of creation, the pain and suffering that's caused through natural disaster, as well as the fact that you and I are all disasters. All of that will be renewed when he comes again. What are we supposed to do about suffering and pain and evil and death? Well, we're not supposed to act as if it doesn't exist, because that will be a lie. Of course it does. But we can tell the truth about it. It's horrible right now. So we minister to those who suffer. We stand with those and we mourn with those who mourn. We weep with those who weep. We rejoice with those who rejoice. But in doing so in the present, we know whatever pain and suffering we live through, it is not the final word. It does not define us. What defines us is the future that God has for us, the future that we call into the present every time we pray the future that we call into the present every time we worship, the future that we long for and we seek in what the Spirit is doing among us now. So, it all starts with the mess of sin. But God sees, God hears, God knows, and God comes to rescue. And he comes to rescue us himself by rolling up his sleeves, getting involved in the mess of the world, and overcoming it through the resurrection. So whatever suffering there is now, it's time limited because he will come again and all things shall be made new.